I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Sierra Gonzalez, and I'm with the Skoll Foundation. Uh, this is my first forum, so if there are any other newbies out there, more power to you. I'm one of you. Um, and I'd like to welcome you officially to the interactive workshop, Spreading the Good News, How to Tell Impact Stories in the Digital Age. In this workshop, we will learn practical steps to leverage social media platforms and share powerful stories from our work. With that, I would like to introduce our facilitators, Hashem and Dariush from Soul Pancake. Okay, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, I'm Dariush. We're really excited to be here. A couple of notes at the top before we get started. Uh, first, everyone is welcome here, but just as a caveat, I want you to know that we're going to be spending, there's a worksheet in front of you, we're going to be spending some of this time really trying to practically dive in and do some work together to try to help arm you with some tasks that you can do when you get home to make sure that you keep the momentum going. So everyone is welcome here, but it is uh, ideally you're here prepared to like actually think through and like get tacti tactical with your social media plan. The other thing is we actually have a fair amount of information to get through, so we're going to be just blasting through. This is not where the conversation has to end, though. Both of us are eminently findable. We're also going to show our uh, emails at some point to make sure that everyone has it. We want to be a resource to everyone here, so if, if, some, if it's going fast, like just absorb what you can. We're going to dump a bunch of stuff on you, and then hopefully some of it percolates to the top, and you can use it when you get done when you're back home. And then uh, to give you a sense of how we're going to do this, first we're going to introduce you to who we are, Soul Pancake, why we're up here, why we're the alleged experts in this space. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about creativity in video form, break down what it really means to do, express your creativity in video and some thoughts about how that could, how, how you, just like what the process looks like. I'm going to tell you a little bit about digital storytelling frameworks. Um, basically, it's not rules, but it's kind of like rules of ways to think about how you can do things effectively on social media. Then we're going to do the workshop, and then after the workshop, we're going to do the Q&A. We're going to try to spend at least a half an hour on the workshop. Ideally, we can get through everything a little bit more faster, and we can get to the workshop. And really, we want to answer everyone's questions and get into it with you. So without further ado, welcome to the uh, Spreading the Good News workshop. Thank you guys so much for being here. We really hope that you get something productive out of the session today. Um, to get us started, we have a video that introduces Soul Pancake and the sort of tone and vibe of the sort of content that we make. And then after that, we'll tell you a little bit more about our background. Right, so that just gave you a taste of uh, some of our content. Um, but Soul Pancake, just to give you a little background, we've been around for 10 years. Uh, we actually started, um, we were started by Rain Wilson, who if you've seen the American version of The Office, he is the character Dwight. Um, a very brilliant, funny actor, um, but also someone that just really cares about uh, the world and especially what's happening on the internet. Um, and when he started Soul Pancake with a group of friends, what he wanted to do was create a space on the internet where people could come and ask life's big questions. Um, so initially it was just a website where people would come and they would say, you know, how can I find creativity in my work? Uh, how can I find purpose uh, as I'm, you know, spending time with my family? Just big questions that they wanted to uh, find answers to. And the idea was that it was just uh, an open space where other users could come and give their perspective. So uh, over a few years, we actually gained a, a large community of people who 
were uh, both asking questions and answering questions. And after a few years of doing that, we sort of compiled some of these ideas that were coming across through the website. Uh, we published a book, which was best-selling. Uh, we gained some um, admirers, including Oprah Winfrey, and she invited us to come and make some videos for uh, her cable television network. So as we're starting to create videos for Oprah Winfrey, um, we also realized this was around 2010-11, um, it was clear that young people especially were moving to video platforms, especially YouTube, and that's where they were having their conversations. They weren't necessarily going on a website um, and posting questions. So in order to reach that audience, we pivoted uh, our business a little and started just making more video. Um, so um, really what we were trying to do is, uh, through our videos, uh, as you saw here, is to celebrate the human experience in many ways, uh, to continue asking those life's big questions. And uh, especially we focused on building empathy, so bringing people that maybe aren't necessarily always together in the same space uh, together uh, on camera and showing that. Um, but we also wanted to celebrate curiosity and disrupt the status quo with joy. Joy is sort of like the central theme of our company. If you could tell from that video, there's lots of color, there's lots of laughter. Um, there's all the other emotions as well, but I would say joy is our number one uh, go-to emotion. Um, so as we've continued to work um, through the years, we've amassed uh, an audience of over 50 million uh, monthly. Uh, our reach is over 50 million. Uh, we have over 3 million subscribers on YouTube, and we're also on Facebook, uh, and all the platforms you can imagine. Um, so we were really in this digital space, um, and after a few years ago, we were uh, approached by Participant Media to join together as a team, as one company, um, to really extend what they're doing. I'm sure you've all heard of Participant Media. Uh, there was a little bit about it yesterday in the plenary, but they make beautiful, wonderful films, and the idea is that a good story well told uh, can change the world. And so there was an example yesterday of Roma and how the, the story of Roma was able to make an impact um, and is still continuing to make an impact uh, with domestic workers. So um, together, you can imagine we have now this very broad audience that we were able to engage through feature films, through uh, participants' amazing impact work, um, and now us also in the digital space. Um, these are just some examples of our, uh, our series. There's one I wanted to mention in particular, or maybe a couple. Um, our, probably our biggest viral hit, our first big hit, was uh, a series with a little boy who was eight years old in Ohio, Michigan, um, who wanted to be president. And he called himself Kid President. And maybe some of you have seen this. Um, but he would basically, he, he made a little oval office uh, in, his, in his basement with his brother. And they would just um, give proclamations as president. Um, and there were just messages um, really exploring how, from a kid's perspective, what a, so a leader could be. And really, he talked about just being awesome, being generous, being joyful, laughing, dancing. Um, anyway, it really struck a chord with an audience, um, in particular with people in the education space, uh, including a lot of teachers. So um, both those videos and some curriculum we've developed around it are used in classrooms all around the United States. Um, so that's one type of content we make. Uh, to the other side, maybe I'll, I'll also say like a recent hit we've had is uh, a dating show where people come together and it's a blind date situation. And the idea is that they're sort of exploring the sort of underlying assumptions that we make about someone when we first meet them. When you first see someone's face, um, what, do you, you know, what do you think their background is? What do you think their name is? So they just start from zero and uh, sort of start telling each other their story. Um, and they decide if they want to date or not at the end. <laughs> and as I mentioned, we're funded by Ray Wilson. So um, that's the background of, of the company. We want to talk to you a little bit about what it is that has made Soul Pancake distinguished as a business. Uh, and I think that it's really it's helpful to understand because understanding what made what worked about Soul Pancake is 
just one of the lenses through which you can understand what could work about your voice. We're not saying this is the only way, but this is, this, you'll see that from here there are some lessons that you can take into your work. So the three things that I have found tend to be that uh, the things that differentiate us is we have really, really good creative, particularly with a focus on emotive storytelling and, ca and capturing emotion, <coughs> human emotion in four to five minute videos. We also have reach and consistency. We're not the biggest digital publisher out there, but we have a very consistent audience because we have differentiated our voice and people come to us for very specific things. We'll get into that a little bit more in the later sections. And then we also have, uh, obviously, you know, since our inception and also especially since we joined up with Participant, there's a purpose and impact side to what we do, which is something that people are thirsting for. And so that just, I think that what, what, that, what you should take from that is that there's actually a huge audience for, of people who want to be engaged in the positive work of moving the world into a more progressive, better place. And those are people that are our audience. There's also many, of them, many others out there, and they could be your audience as well, beyond the people that you're working with in your impact space. So from the creative perspective, I'm really, I, I mean, there's a lot here, but I don't want to dwell on it too much. There's a lot of different things that we ha are doing now as part of building our brand. Um, we do brand storytelling. It's one of our sources of revenue. We do have a digital uh, storytelling platform, which goes through all of the different platforms from Snapchat to Instagram to Facebook to YouTube. Um, we're also constantly trying to experiment with new things. One of the things, I'm relatively new to the Soul Pancake team. I'm there less than a year so, so far. But one of the things that I credit the team with doing very well is identifying new and upcoming platforms and working with YouTube when YouTube is really important, working with Facebook when Facebook is really important, engaging in Snapchat. Now we're looking at potentially other things like AR and live stream. So really trying to find the digital platforms and engage them as they're, as they're emerging. Uh, we have sold TV shows even before we were at Participant. There was a lot of distribute or uh, effort to create shows digitally that can then be you know, sort of upstreamed into TV. And there's a couple of examples of that. Um, we've done some social impact campaigns. We also do experiential work with our fans. So one of the great things about digital is that sort of you can access it everywhere, but one of the downsides is it's not really a deep human connection. And so we found that when we are able to engage with people in the real world, either in live shows or in conventions, we are able to take this conversation to a new place. Um, and then we also have distribution partners that help us distribute beyond even our platform when we want to create a wider campaign. Um, so I'm going to actually skip this. We, this is an example of a specific impact campaign that we did, but for time's sake, we don't want to spend time watching the video. But essentially, you know, this is an example of a story that we told where we were, um, this is a young man who, named Virgil who used an air mattress to rescue friends and family during the Houston uh, hurricane. And he literally just like paddled himself over and grabbed people from rooftops floating on an air mattress. It's a really amazing, heartwarming story. And what we did is try to focus on his particular emotional journey and what it meant for him. And what we did is we surprised him with a standing ovation from his community. So he could feel, you know, while everyone had expressed admiration for him, you know, this was a moment that he could feel that admiration from the community as a whole and that support. Um, and that was connected to a larger impact campaign. So. I'm gonna skip the video. Um, sorry, I know I, we want to watch it, but I, 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 there's tons of videos. I, I encourage you to watch our channel. Like I, it's we, we when we were do, doing the timing, we realized it's a little too much time. So uh, we're, we'll come back to. I uh, hope you guys watch our videos on your own. Um, I'm sorry, but I want you. I want to give you the tools. So uh, when it comes to reach, um, these are just some statistics of the sorts of people that are engaging with us and uh, and what it means. Uh, some things to call out, our average watch time is four minutes, nine seconds. I don't know what your backgrounds are, but I think that might seem low. That's actually extremely high for digital watch time. That means that people are engaging through almost the end of our videos. Um, and then that, that means that they're really finding something there that they want to watch. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're able to create some shows that are you know, 15 to 20 minutes long. We find that digital audiences are willing to stick around if you really capture them and if you don't waste their time. So it's really about finding the stories and then making sure that you're using every minute, every second effectively. Um, our gender breakdown is, depending on the platform, it's 60 to 65% female. So it skews female, but it's definitely not extremely female, which is, I think, something that a lot of people assume when you're looking at the impact audience. Uh, people that don't know our analytics assume that we are 80 to 90% female, but we're not. We actually skew female, but we're fairly balanced. Um, we have a pretty good reach, and we have a, a lot of people that are in our audience that are college educated. Um, I think that just sort of 
something that comes along with the territory of trying to be in the impact space. Something that I don't think is highlighted on here, but is notable is that our community is actually very diverse in their viewpoints and the way that they see the world. They are all people who see that something is missing, that's something that they want to have a deeper purpose. They want to engage in making the world a better place, but their value sets are very diverse. 30% of our audience self-identifies as Christian conservative. And you know, a lot of our audience is also like coastal liberal. And so it is a really interesting space because that means that these people have political views that are very, very different, but they have a value view, an underlying human value set that is unifying. And so it's a challenge for us sometimes because we need to create programming that works for both people. Or if we're going to look at an issue that we need to look at it from a perspective that is not necessarily, I think it's okay to go edgy, but trying to be nonpartisan in our po politics and really trying to make it clear that we're talking about the deeper underlying human values and human emotions. Um, we've had a, a bunch of really interesting and successful impact campaigns. Uh, some, you know, we've worked with animal shelters, with uh, uh, My Last Days, which is a show that we made that is, highlights people who are um, diagnosed with a terminal illness. Uh, there, it's actually a really interesting type of show because it's a story about people that are about to die, but they're all incredible, very, very dynamic personalities. So in some ways they feel very, very alive, much more alive than you would expect them to be. And the, the, there's a lot of joy and positive emotion in the show. And so we did impact campaigns around that. Um, and then we partnered with Participant in a bunch of things. And uh, I think something that I'm particularly proud of that is relatively recent is um, we were able to um, release the Price of Free documentary about Kala Satyarti on the Soul Pancake channel. And as part of that distribution, we were able to uh, engage YouTube in their money. They have a, a product that's specifically created to help nonprofits raise money and their, their blue donate button. And so we created, we didn't just distribute the movie, we created social assets to help our audience understand what the issue is and to contextualize the movie for them. And all of that together was used as a fundraiser for the foundation. Um, and final note is to think about People are talking a lot about val value-driven consumers. We like to think of them as compassionate consumers. That means that they're people who have compassion for the rest of the world and, for pe and have empathy for the way that the rest of the world is thinking and feeling. And they are aware of the fact that their context isn't the only context. And so they want to express those values in the way that they're engaging the world. Um, so uh, we, we've done some emotional analytics. You'll see the millions of ugly cries is a thing that we kind of say a lot because a lot of our emotion, like it is very emotive con content and a lot of it does uh, elicit some tears. Um, and then, so this is back, you know, there's a bunch of different ways that we can partner with people. Uh, and we've, brands we've spooned with, I think that this is an important part of the story, not just because it's, uh, it's a funny way of saying it, uh, but you know, what we're really trying to do is we're not trying to it's a balance what we do because we're trying to build a business and really effectively um, not just work on impact campaigns, but also have something that is going to sustain itself and be able to have a lot of different partners. And what I have found re really refreshing is that a lot of the brands have a really specific way that they're trying to engage in their audiences and they're willing to sort of understand that there's a specific way that you work with participant there's a specific way that you work with soul pancake it's not the same as the way when you work with other brands um, and so there really can be through a lot of difficult dialogue and conversations you can create places where there's a win-win between the two different parties um, so that's the download about soul pancake are there before we move on to talking a little bit more about the digital frameworks do you guys have any questions about soul pancake where we come from how we do things um, want to answer those and then we're going to get into the more practical stuff. Hi, I'm Alyssa from the Skull Foundation. Uh, I just had a quick question based on the analytics you were showing around like number of college educated mm -hmm. uh, and things that are more specific. How are you collecting that information on your audience? To That's a great question and one of the things that I actually were hoping to do during the workshop section is collect everybody's email. We'd love to follow up with sending you out the, res the links to the resources that we use to analyze our audience. There's two different types of analytics that you can, there are actually three different types of analytics that you can get from social media platforms. There's the owned and operated analytics that are provided by places like Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and all that. Those are pretty good. Then there is additional uh, analytics that you can get from plugins and from other providers whose business is essentially to help content creators understand their audience better and monetize better. There's a bunch of these that are 
free and that are, their whole purpose is that you give them a little bit more access and through that access they have more data that they can then share with you. And then the third kind is there's a, because we're a business, we're able to subscribe to a couple of um, very, very, um, very technologically adept and driven platforms that can dive into those uh, the analytics and the data platforms from those proprietary platforms and provide using AI and different types of analysis an even deeper level of understanding of the emotions that the people are feeling, you know, looking at comments and trying to create a picture of our audience. That's some of the stuff that is, unfortunately, it can be a little bit expensive because it's something, it, for us, it's important for as a business. Um, I will provide links to all of those as well um, because it's good to know what the resources are that are out there. But you can do pretty well with understanding your audience just based on the, the basic analytics and the plugins that, that are available. Uh, one or two more and then we'll move on. Uh, Hi, my name is Maria Springer and I'm interested to know how you guys are going to use VR and live video in your strategy moving forward because I think that's something that we're probably a little bit behind on. Totally. I'm sorry, I'm speaking for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, I hope I didn't. My laugh is loud and I've blown out mics before when I laugh. <laughs> and so I apologize if, if I like assault your eardrums. So uh, we'll come back to this when we get into the specifics. But essentially, our strategy when we're engaging something new is to be experimental with it. So we have a couple of theories about things that we want to do that will be interesting. With live streaming, we're interested in seeing how we can look at the arts and the arts as an expression of human spirit and finding and presenting those in a live format because we think that that's just we have an intuition that that's something that people will resonate with so for example we have a lego show called brick by brick we're going to show this lego master builder building things on in a live stream and just sort of we i think it's really interesting to see an expert be really good at their hands and put something together that you your body just can never do um, or my body can never do. Um, so that's our intuition, but we're going to test it and see how it does. Um, with a VR, we've done some stuff, but the best I think the best use of VR is to create two-dimensional videos with VR. So you saw in our trailer, there's a we did a mixed media in which we immersed people in famous art pieces in a VR experience, and then we filmed them interacting with it against a green screen, and then we composited them onto the actual artwork that they were interacting with. So I think some of the VR stuff, it's best to, to sort of combine people in VR with other th backgrounds so that you can just create a video at the end of it because most people don't have headsets. And then with AR, I think the, the best and most interesting stuff that's happening in AR, al alternate reality, is on Snapchat. They've created a lens studio so that any artist around the world can create a lens, an AR lens, and they can map something else onto the reality as people are on Snapchat. There's 400,000 lenses being created. We've had lenses that, that we, we create lenses through Cyrene Kriamko, who we'll talk about in our breakout. And some of our lenses have gone viral. And that's a really interesting space to experiment with. And also, what's nice about AR is you can interact with live spaces. So you can say, like, oh, this is going to be something that you can only see in this particular geography. Um, all right, one last question. I'm Jeffrey Lean. Looking at your impact stuff, it went past fairly fast. Um, yeah, sorry, we're trying all, to... It, it all seemed to be motivating individuals to give money or dog food or something like that, which is fine. But do you also aim at policy change, and have you any examples of that? Honestly, I don't think that brands like Soul Pancake are best leveraged for policy change. I think we, have, we are a consumer brand, and we work with consumers. It's a good question. <laughs> Um, I, I think that we would be very happy to partner with people who want to work for policy change, but the best use of a brand like Soul Pancake is in trying to reach the audience directly and get them to engage in some sort of action. And it could be that the engagement is then to lead to policy change or to amassing participants and, and building a community to, to, towards policy change. But it's how, not. How would you partner with an organization for policy change? That's a very interesting idea. Yeah, I think that might be a breakout question. I'm happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Um, so. We're going to dive into the next step. Hashem is going to tell you a little bit about his background and then also thinking about creativity in video form. So I'll pass it the mic. <clears throat> My background? All right. <laughs> um, yeah, just very briefly. So I'm the head of production at Soul Pancake. So I oversee our, uh, once we green light a project and uh, decide we want to go forward with something, then it comes to me and my team and we actually go out and hire the producers, directors, and all the people that are going to actually make it and see it through all the way to delivery. Um, 
So yeah, and my background is in documentary film. I worked in feature documentaries for five years um, and then moved into the digital space. I worked with uh, Deepak Chopra for a few years on some content that he was making for the, for the web. Um, and then also we created a show for the Oprah Winfrey Network, which I was a producer on as well. So, and then I have been at Soul Pancake for about four years now. Um, but uh, I think my documentary training actually was really helpful because um, in, you know, in documentary, feature documentaries, you know, you, sometimes you have to spend years, um, yeah, usually it's years um, trying to get that final story together and getting through all the steps. Um, but what's great about Soul Pancake and the digital platform is that you can make things really fast uh, and learn. Um, you don't have to be too precious about what you're making. Um, we, we try to, you know, we put all our efforts and try to make it as beautiful and wonderful as we can, but we also know that we can try again the next day. We literally put out um, almost a video every day, if not every other day. So there's just a ton of content that we're creating. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and so for the next few slides, we just wanted to think about um, sort of what are some like underlying ideas that all of us can think of when we're creating media uh, for our respective organizations. And one place to start perhaps is just uh, on a very basic level, just thinking about what is media. Um, and when you boil it down, as we all know, it's just um, it's a form of communication, right? There's uh, a, you know, person A or uh, the the creator, A, uh, trying to send a message or uh, relay a message to the recipient, um, who's the consumer or the audience. Um, so on a very basic level, um, media is just representative of all the different types of mediums uh, or forms that that can take, right? That, that message uh, on a very simple level, even right now, I'm talking to you, I'm using the medium of uh, conversation or language to convey a message to you. So these are very basic things that we all take part in every day in communication. There's also obviously language and dance and pictures and things that are more on like a one-to-one -one basis. But then what we've been talking about today is uh, more like mass media where there's a creator uh, or a producer that is creating and sending a message to millions of people. Um, so as you think, as we think of this um, this relationship that's created between whoever's uh, speaking or sending the message and those receiving it, uh, obviously we can think that maybe um, the medium uh, plays a big role in uh, how that uh, message is received. Um, and at, at Soul Pancake, when we're thinking about sort of the story uh, in a video what we're thinking about is what you can see and what you can hear, right? So there's sort of objective uh, things, there are subjective elements like visually what you're going to see, what you're going to hear. Um, and it's something that anyone watching the video would probably say the same thing. These are the things that we see and hear. And that's sort of the story. Um, and um, sometimes we refer to that as the text, right? It's the stuff that you see. Um, but obviously underlying all of that is the, the interpretation or the meaning, which is the subtext. And that's where things get really fun and interesting, right? Is when you actually, not when you're focusing on the sort of the form, but more on like the meaning. And uh, one thing we try to think about a lot is what is our intended meaning? So when we're putting out a video that's about people jumping into um, a ball pit uh, and having a conversation, what are we trying to really say? What are we really trying to convey uh, on a deeper level? Um, and then we also try to think um, what is going to be the perceived meaning. And that requires a little bit of uh, effort and understand our audience, like how they're going to perceive the meaning. Um, but also uh, what we've realized is that um, meaning um, is often taken through or understood through some very deep-seated, what I would call just human convictions or even like uh, elements of our soul, right? Uh, these are things like that we've talked about already, like joy, uh, love, connection, um, uh, generosity, um, but also even things as powerful as freedom and truth and justice and power. So those are really what we're trying to focus on in our um, in our content, um, and uh, we we try to use emotions to also. Um, 
uh, try to get to some of those ideas and really uh, touch on those uh, powerful deep-seated convictions. Is there any questions about this before I move on? Sorry, I'll repeat. Is there a process on how you figure out the, pro the, the meaning, what you intend to convey? Like, how do you do it? Do you like do like a uh, whiteboard? Do, like, how, what, how do you get to that? That's a great question. And hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's something that um, has evolved over the years for us. But it always starts with consultation, I would say. It's a big, uh, it's, a, it's a group. Uh, discussion. There are people in our company and probably in your organizations as well who are maybe tasked more than others with thinking about communication or being creative or things like that. They might have that in their title even. But what we try to do is uh, open it up to everyone on our team to bring in ideas, uh, consult about it. Everyone's thoughts and opinions uh, matter and are important. And then uh, together we build a vision and uh, not only of what it's going to look like, but also what the what the meaning is that we're trying to get at. And when we showed the the slide with um, all those brands that we've spooned with, um, a lot of them come to us with uh, something very simple. They're just like, we want to make um, a video that comes out around this time, and we want it. You know, we want to help our audience think about um, or connect our product or our brand with something like generosity. So how can we do that? So our, our uh, process is to think about how to connect these things. Um, and yeah, we take everyone's experiences. And yeah, we definitely use a lot of whiteboards too, too and Google Docs. Um, but just to run quickly through this process, um, I'm sure many of you are aware of this process. But um, there's really like five big steps whenever you're making content, especially video content. Uh, in the development phase, we're usually thinking of what's the vision for the project as a whole. Um, and we set goals. Um, we do creative development, which is writing. It's a lot of writing and um, going back and forth with thinking about what the creative um, of the project is going to be. That includes scripts and beat sheets. If something is unscripted, we, we write something called a beat sheet, which is just sort of an idea of like, what are the different beats in the video? What are the different uh, scenes that we, we, we might try to get? And of course, there's always the nuts and bolts of budgeting and setting a timeline. And this is also a great time to bring in partners because you don't want to bring in a partner after you've already built in a built a vision and set a goal and have all those things put in place. So uh, we spend a lot of time on this phase uh, of development. Um, then we move into pre-production, um, which is just you know booking and confirming all the people and places and the things. So we have our creative locked, so now we're just figuring out nuts and bolts. Um, and then production is ac actually just when you usually say we're filming something or we're shooting something, we're referring to that phase. Um, and then post-production is where the story and the edit come together. Um, and uh, I just bolded there that it's an iterative process. So it's something that you go through over and over again with your team. Um, and again, looking back when you were developing the idea, like what was the vision that you had uh, as a team? Uh, how are we meeting those goals now that we've shot everything and are putting the story together? And then a big part of this, obviously, is the last part, which is publishing and sharing uh, what you've made. So um, yeah, for us, that includes um, engaging with our audience. Like We are putting out a message, right? Like we're going back to that first slide. But we also, at that point, we now start receiving messages. So it just becomes sort of more of a conversation at that point, um, if not sooner. And then, uh, as we said, with, uh, with impact work, um, there's a lot of things that you can do once the, um, your product, your, your content is made, um, including like targeted screenings or making supplemental materials that go with your, uh, with your video content. So this is, in a very basic uh, five-minute way, just sort of like the process uh, that we go through uh, at Soul Pancake for creating content. <laughs> Any questions on this? Um, so the, the last part where you're receiving messages uh, from the audience, what if you're receiving a message that should have been taken into account at the development process? Isn't that dangerous? Like, I mean, I don't know, I just feel like it's backwards. Well, yeah, I mean, maybe this is almost not linear. It's like a 
circular in some ways because as I said and we mentioned already you are creating things and putting things out constantly so as one video is coming out we are already starting on the next one you're in developing in the next one or you might be in production on the next one so it's constant learning growing um, yeah that's a good question I'll keep going for now um, so just very briefly um, I just wrote one word on the slide, but there's obviously a lot of tools that you can use uh, in this process. So um, we just wanted to make clear, um, we're, we, you know, we work with a lot of brands, we do a lot of things, uh, we're on every platform, but to be honest with you, we make stuff that costs you know, $50. Um, it's, we can make a video with $50 up to millions of dollars. We've done all of that and so can you. So if you have no money, no budget, there are so many tools right now, even with our phones, with free things available on the internet. Um, it's uh, the don't. I would say don't focus too much on the the tools that you need uh, to make it because there are um, there are a lot of things available, and it's more about you know telling that story. For us, the story is the most important thing. Um, one thing I will tell you though is that audio is something that people don't think about very much. Um, so if you are capturing things on a phone or somewhere else, that it's always helpful to um, make sure you're thinking about the audio aspect of it. Um, and then the, the one other tool also, which uh, we mentioned already, are just all the data tools that are available to you. So even as we're as filmmakers, as creators, we're, or content creators, we're thinking of our of those audio and visual tools. We should also immediately also think of those data tools that are available to us. It's just part of the package now. Um, <clears throat> and then the idea with just the people thing is, um, I think I already mentioned it, but as, as you're thinking about the ideas um, for your organization, that um, don't always feel like you have to put um, someone with a lot of experience um, with filmmaking or content creation uh, as the as the head of uh, or at the center of what you're doing, um, it's really someone that un understands the voice of your organization. That um, yeah, that is able to collaborate with others since it's such a collaborative um, space. So we just wanted to mention that it's important to get the right group of people together from the beginning, and it doesn't always have to be someone that just ha knows all about filmmaking or content creation. And then we've talked about this, but um, yeah, emo we, we always go back to like, what is the emotion that this video is getting through? Um, this seems to be one of the sort of like through lines of this whole conference um, so far. Uh, it was mentioned yesterday that um, just well-told stories full of emotion are um, what really helps uh, move impact forward. Um, so anyway, we'll talk more about that, but. Those are just some of the top line things we wanted to, to share with you in terms of thinking about uh, creativity and most of all just that it's all about doing learning and growing and it doesn't have to be perfect. I'll pass it off to Dar. Thanks. So my background is I, I kind of stumbled into the digital world when I first came to LA, I wanted to work in entertainment, and I ended up working at Maker Studios, which was a digital startup focused on creating a YouTube um, content studio, kind of similar to the old model, but specifically on YouTube. Um, I started it just because it seemed like it was fun, and I had friends that were working there, and they were doing interesting things, and I thought, oh, that sounds cool. So it was an interesting space. As it turned out, Maker became very successful in a particular kind of thing. We grew very, very rapidly. Eventually, we were acquired by Disney. So then I went from being an insurgent and being really excited to change the system to working for the system like implicitly uh, for years, which was a really jarring but also educational experience. So I got to see sort of different types of ways of thinking about digital and the different ways that um, people can come to these frameworks. And I also saw some of the ways in which a large organization like Disney can be challenged by the, the, the norms of how you're supposed to engage audiences online. I think we came to some solutions, but we also had a lot of failures. And some of the failures at Disney taught me probably more than anything else I ever learned in the space. And um, the reason I ended up here at, at Soul Pancake and I participated is because I actually had a crisis of conscience. I didn't like 
the sorts of things that I had to do to make money. And then I quit my job, traveled and, and realized I was just burned out and I wanted to find, I, and I really like what I do. I just need to find a way to do it um, with a greater purpose. And that's why I'm really excited to be here. And that greater purpose is also why I'm really excited to be here with you all because having the experience and having the things that I've learned is great and being able to do it in work, you know, it's all pancake in a way that is meaningful for an audience is great, but being able to offer it as a service to you is really, really special. So I'm going to share with you seven rules about digital storytelling, but I want to make clear that they're I'm only saying rules because it's like an easy way of expressing it. It's really a framework and a framework is something that is just a basic way of understanding the scope of how we can do the work. But all of these are subject to change based on how things move. And I think ideally these are all things that you can verify for yourself or verify that they don't apply to your work. So think of them as a starting point, not the ending point. And also like any expert, like I'm only an expert because of the thing, the work that I've done recently, like the, you will become an expert in your own content as you make it. And you need to trust your expertise and your intuition. So that being said, here are some things, ways to think about digital storytelling. Um, first rule, going back to this idea of forget for perfection, just make stuff. There are so many benefits to just getting out there and making things. And this is, I think, one of the places in which impact can be actually similar to a large corporation like Disney, because there's a lot of concern about how things can be perceived, how things can go poorly, like what could go wrong. And I think that's totally valid and fair. Totally get it. That being said, there is a ton of benefit. You have to weigh that against the tremendous benefit of just getting out there and making things. Because when you make things, a couple of things happen. Number one, you start to learn from the feedback. You learn from what the data is telling you, you learn from what the audience is commenting to you. Um, you start to learn based on what performs and what doesn't perform. So you're immediately, even if you put up 10 crappy videos, like the reasons why each of them are crappy are probably gonna be different and they'll each teach you different things. Uh, the other thing that happens is that audiences start to find your content. So even if it is 10 crappy videos, there's probably a reason you made those videos and there's probably a specific way that they relate to your impact work. And there, I guarantee you, there is somebody Googling the problem that you're trying to address. And even if it's just 15 people that find it and then click on the video, they are, they, you are already engaged in the process of magnetizing people towards you based on the actual work that you're doing. And then the other thing that is really, really great is that as you start putting things out into the world, you're putting a signal out and you will also get a response from collaborators who want to work with you. So that doesn't just mean the audience is going to find you. That means that potentially filmmakers or digital storytellers or influencers who are interested in the work that you're doing are more likely to find you and want to partner with you. Uh, one of the things that it, I think is so interesting is that there are so many storytellers who recognize that there needs to be change in the world and they are very passionate about some, some issues, but they may be less experienced in those issues or in the way that impact can create interventions around those issues. And so once you start making some kind of content, you're more likely to run into those people and they can then help you with your storytelling. The second rule is talk to your friends. By this I mean it's really easy when you start to present things and especially presenting them digitally or in media to present them kind of like our reel, our one minute reel that we presented in the beginning. You know, we're telling you a story, it's very formal, you know, we interviewed people, they dressed nice, all these things. And so when you're talking on social media, it can start to feel like, um, you know, disconnected from who you are as a person. An audience at the end of the day is made up of individuals, right? People in each of you have watched, wait, how many people here have watched a YouTube video at some point in your life? So each individual here has watched, ha, has, has become a part of an audience. And then beyond that, each of us are part of communities that engage in audience, in content in sort of specific ways. So for example, I like to play video games. I like to watch people vi play video games on YouTube, both because it's really fun and funny and they're all really interesting people. Some of them are weird people, but also because it makes me better at playing video games. So everyone, there's different communities that become audiences. Audiences also engage in content through social constructs, the way that they understand themselves in the context of their society. But most of all, audience is people you know. So when you're thinking about making videos and thinking about how you're trying to express yourself, or maybe you're not making videos, maybe you're just putting up posts on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, or you're uh, 
taking a picture of an impact camp of something that is happening in the field and you want to share it, think about sharing it with someone you know. So something that I sometimes do when I'm posting on Instagram is I actually think about my mom and I think about like the inside jokes that I have with my family and the way that my mom would probably make fun of me for thinking that I'm like important or interesting. And so like <laughs> it makes me a lot more self-deprecating sort of having to predict the way that my family will make fun of me and then and use that as part of my personal social media like voice. So think about people you know and how you talk to them, whatever that is, because at the end of the day, when your personality comes through, you're going to have a lot more direct connections with people. The third rule is to listen to the data. This one is probably going to be a for real thing for the rest of time as long as there's social media because the data is really powerful, the data is really interesting. There's actually a lot of really, really interesting people that are helping impact groups try to un unleash the data on their impact campaigns. Um, and the, what's really nice about social media is you can also have a layer on top of the data that you're getting from your impact, the layer that the, the data that you're getting from your audience. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting ways to slice and dice it. Unfortunately, it's very technical. It's kind of hard for us to get into it right now. That's why in the workshop section, we're going to ask you to, if whoever's willing, to provide us with your email so that we can then email out a bunch of different links to things that you can use. Um, and again, I'm happy to dive into it a little bit more afterwards with whoever wants breakout. Um, so this is just an example of a screenshot from the CMS of, uh, that we use to manage our content on YouTube. And these are the top videos watched by our subscribers for a window of time. I forget if it was like a week or something like that. But essentially, this is how we think about content. We look at a period, so a week or a month or two months, and then we say, okay, our subscribers, the people who have made the choice to watch our videos, how many of them are what? What are they watching? What is popular with them? So that's clearly what they're coming back for. How long are they watching it for? Like, you know, which is getting the most engagement and which is getting the most absolute views? And it's trying to think about different angles at which you can look at the audience is really helpful. So not just is it getting views, but is it getting engagements? What kind of engagements is it getting? Sometimes I find that our most successful videos are the ones that have heated debates in them because it brings together the conservative and liberal people that are in our, in our audience and then they're debating each other and, you know, people are getting heated, we're having to moderate, we're having to like, you know, delete comments because people are saying heated things. But the nice thing is that is attracting more people to watch the video and it's creating a conversation that can then be shared and perpetuated. And we're not trying to, most of the time we're not saying that we have answers, we're just saying here are some interesting questions or here are some interesting things to talk about. Um, fourth rule, as DJ Khaled would say, that consistency is a major key. Anybody DJ Khaled? No? Okay, that's all right. Uh, <laughs> So consistency is really important on social media and consistency is a bunch of different things. It doesn't, it means consistency of timing of when you post things, how often you post things. So it's okay to post every day. It's okay to post once a week, but you have to do it consistently. Any less than once a week is a little bit tough. I think once every other week, it, people are just not going to create a pattern of, of engaging with you, but whatever you're doing, do it consistently and consistently and be able to, people should be able to find it in a consistent way. Consistency also means tone and aesthetic. So people start to know that they can expect a certain kind of thing from you or a certain type of vibe. Uh, consistency also means consistency of collaborators. So like if you are collaborating with social media people, like maybe some of them do well and try to give those people back onto your platforms. Um, so consistency is you're really building habits because at the end of the day, a viewer is going to find you once, find you twice, find you three times, and then maybe on the fourth time they hit subscribe. And so you really want to create habits. You're trying to broadcast something that is going to start bringing people in on an ongoing basis. An example of what we've done to create consistency, um, we found that people really like, so one time we posted an inspirational quote because we didn't have any like images to post on our Instagram and people responded like crazy to it. So, okay, all right, so let's post some more quotes. And then people respond like crazy. So eventually we realized that we have to post quotes at least once a week on Instagram or else people start to, like, like pe people want to get that from us. So yeah, folks love quotes. Um, and, it's, and now we're trying to partner with different um, illustrators to create illustrated graphical versions of quotes that we like. And so that that way it's not just the quote, but it's also an illustration. It's some, an aesthetic that they can tie to us. Rule number five, the clickable principle. Um, this is actually really, really, um, I have not shared this principle in a public setting before because it's part of my personal secret sauce. Mm -hmm. So you're welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that people don't realize about social media is that it's actually, people say it's 
dumb all the time, but I think what they mean is it's very, uh, it's very blatant. When you are saying something, when your people are clicking on a video, they're clicking on it for a very specific and clear reason. That means that they saw a thumbnail or they saw a title or they saw a keyword and it's very specific and you want to keep the distance between the reality of the video and the advertising of the, of the video uh, thumbnail or of the title keywords. You want to keep that distance very, very shallow. Because if you say something like, you know, are you worried about the way that people are engaging with technology today? Here are some strategies for dealing with you know, technology in a more humane way. And the people click on the video and it's about like, so, you know, the technology of making spaghetti and you know, rolling dough through the spaghetti maker. Like, people are going to feel like they didn't get what they came for. But it's even more nuanced than that. If you say things like the, the emotional words or the key words that you're using to bring people in, think about how those are specifically tied to the video that they're getting and that they're getting delivered. So this is a really good example. It's, it, it, it seems kind of silly, but this, we did a video called uh, Drive Through Work Employees Get a Delightful Surprise. And you click on the video and it's this guy, Mark Gagnon, giving surprise gifts to different drive through employees. And it's like flowers or chocolates or whatever. And it's literally just them getting surprised with presents. So that sounds um, uh, juvenile, but the important thing is to realize that like when you're saying this is what you're going to get, deliver on that. And that is one of the best ways to make sure that people keep coming back to you is because they're actually, the algorithms really listen to how much people, when they are surfaced a video, how often they click on it. Rule number six, to thine own self be authentic um, because it's magnetic. And the reason why authenticity is magnetic is, I think this is actually a generational thing to do with millennial and Gen Z generations. Uh, generationally, they're, they, this is a generation that's been marketed to a lot. It's a generation that has been, uh, come of age or grown up under the shadow of the Great Recession. It's a generation that has recognized that there is a lot that is messed up about the world today. And so I think for a lot of these reasons, it's a generation that uniquely seems to pride itself in authenticity and to seek out authenticity in all of the different ways that it engages in the world. So a brand is, at, you know, it's not a generation that is against working with brands or interacting with brands, but it wants to feel like there is something really deep underlying everything, all of those conversations that they're having online. So an example of this, Snapchat is a, a brand, is a platform that tends to do better if you're a little bit more sarcastic or ironic or, you know, sort of tones that don't really work for Soul Pancake. But what we do on Snapchat is kind of like, you know, the silly, joyful, like whatever us that we normally do. So this is Cyrene Kamko who runs our Snapchat account. She's also a graphical artist and she creates a lot of lenses for us. So this is her on our Snapchat explaining that we created a lens for people to share their happy thoughts. And she's talking about how her happy thought is pizza. So again, corny, super corny, right? Not what normally you would find on Snapchat, but it is authentic to our voice. So people that have found Soul Pancake somewhere else know that, oh, I found, I'm going on Snapchat and I'm finding Soul Pancake. It might be a slightly different type of content, but it's the same tone, it's the same, it, we're being authentic to who we are. And I encourage you to be authentic to who you are. My last, and then the last rule is call and response. This is core and central to how social media works and operates. It's, embedded in the very framework of how they, th things go viral. You create something, you put out a call, and then there's a response, and then you embed that response in the next call. It's essentially like singing, right? And there's, it's really important to keep that in mind as you're engaging with your audience because the more, more hooks that you can give them to respond to and then reward them for the response, the more they're likely to come back. So this is an example of, you know, we put out something on Twitter where we created a crossword puzzle and it says the first three words you see will define your 2018 and so we just put a bunch of different fun words all positive words in the crossword puzzle so that people can find it and then send us what they found and send us what their 2018 is going to look like and then we can retweet the ones that are fun or funnier like what people are saying about it um, this one i'm really really proud of uh, on instagram we do a lot of interacting with people through the direct messages and so this is a story, Instagram story, you know, story uh, is, a, is a feature where you post an image or a video and then after 24 hours it goes away. So it's temporary, but what's nice about that is it engages people in a more casual conversation than they would normally engage in. So we ask, do you have a short story about a time where you experienced unexpected kindness from a stranger? Please send it to us in the DM. And so the other two screenshots are someone actually DMing us a really sweet story and then us talking with them back and forth about 
what the story was, telling them telling us the details, us saying, oh, that's so nice. So it's a, you know, it's a direct response back and forth between us and this person. But then what's really important is that we took that response and pushed it out as another call where we actually said, we, we took the, like a, a key part of the story, we put it in the typeface that we use, we gave it a sort of graphical layout and we presented it to the audience again uh, in the, in the story section. So what that did is it reward, it lets people know, oh, they're not just putting out a call to get the response. They're also going to hear me and then broadcast what I say. And that's an important part of how social media works is make sure that you're thinking about the call and response and how you can engage in that. Um, so now we have a half hour to do the workshop, which is exactly what we wanted. <laughs> we are going to, I think the best way to do questions is, for us to come around and answer questions as we're doing the workshop, because that way we can get into the work. Um, so I'm going to steal one of these. And what we're going to do is, who's ready to do the workshop? Wow, no one's ready to do the workshop. That's all right. Who's ready to do the workshop? Yeah. All right. So what we want to do is we're going to time each of the sections. And we're going to try to, because some of them are intended to be done quickly, and some of them are intended to be done more slowly. And once we get to the ones that are more slow, we're going to come around and we're going to interact with everyone. We can answer questions. So wait, wait, wait. Before you look at it, before you look at it, everyone, back, eyes back up here. Eyes up here. Um, the first page is here, organization mission statement. So if you have an organization or if you have an organization that you want to work on, ideally use this to, as literally as you can, express the mission statement in the, in the way that you would express it to other people in impact. So don't try to make it for the audience. Don't try to market it, just state the organization's mission statement. I'm going to give you guys two minutes to do that, and then we're going to move on to the other things. A few more seconds, and then if anyone is willing to share, that would be, we're going to, we'd love to take a couple of people to share their, their mission statement that they just crafted with the, with the room. Um, while everyone finishes up, can I get hands if anyone is willing to share? Okay, so let's do one here and one here. Two, we'll do it good. Yeah. Oh, oh, let's do three. These two, these two, and right here. Okay. All right. So, so everyone, pause. We're gonna we're gonna get share back, and then we're gonna keep keep going with the exercise. Go ahead. Um. So it's creating agents of positive change through quality education for the least privileged. That's great. Spot on. So um, it's to en encourage, engage, equip and empower young women to get involved and participate in politics. Dope. <laughs> Ours is, um, I don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, our mission statement is to help farmers make more money. <laughs> nice, and one more here, right here. Yeah, every child is learning and enjoying their childhood. Dope. I think one more right here. Do I see a hand here? Right here? No? Okay, right here. Thank you all for sharing. This is awesome. I'm already inspired. Rural employment through the skills of art and design. Okay, so this is great. Thank you all for sharing your mission statements. I really appreciate it. Now what we're going to do is we're going to flip to the next page. I'm going to give you one minute. No, to you can't deliberate on this. Four fill in the blanks. And I want you to answer with whatever answer evokes the most emotion in you. Whatever is the thing that leaps out when you see the question. So one minute. I get excited when blank. Blank gives me life. And I most admire blank. Whatever it comes, it can be a location, it can be a person, it can be anything that comes to mind. Anything that, if, that whatever that question evokes for you. So, explanation of why I'm rushing you through this. A key component of engaging in the creative process is at the beginning, disengage your sensor. Because we're, we're all taught through you know, societal pressures or through the way that we're raised, what is right, what is wrong things that are not supposed to be thought or felt. But when you're engaging in the creative process, you have to let go of all that and just let whatever comes to you comes to you. There will be time later to realize that something is a bad idea and to not put it up online. But in the very beginning, you have to engage from a purely 
creative perspective, the way I think of it is literally you're engaging your human heart, your soul in this creative process. Is there anyone that's willing to share their answers here? I know that they're, they can be personal, so you don't have to. Uh, one, one right here. This is a no judgment zone, right? 100% <laughs> no judgment zone. So surrounded by people is where I feel home. Uh, I get excited, excited when the food tastes good. Reading gives me life, and I most admire people who have suffered. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Really appreciate it. Uh, we have two back there. Okay, so uh, India is where I feel home. I get excited when I walk in my forest. Uh, work gives me life. I most admire happy people. Mm. So one right here. Uh, in nature's hot spots with friends is where I feel home. Uh, I get excited when having an impact. Sleep or my wife or daughters give me life. I most admire candid, devoted, dedicated, world-class, impactful change makers. What, uh, right here and then here. Okay. Um, solitude is why I feel at home. Is why I feel at home. I get excited when I see food. <laughs> um, new design challenges gives me life and I most admire kindness right here um, working on the field makes me feel home uh, I get excited when making films and taking photos Stories give me life, and I most admire an opportunity to be around people. Hmm. Uh, right here? Right, right there at the, the edge. Okay, so super no judgment here. Um, super no judgment. Super no judgment. Yep. Um, so by the ocean is where I feel home. I get excited when I find, experience, or discover something new. Um, culture and people give me life, and I most admire Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> right here at the end. Um, freedom is when I feel at home. I get excited when something speaks to me. Purpose gives me life, and I most admire work that's fun. So I'm gonna, I know everyone, we can keep sharing. What's really love, thank you all so much for your answers. Can we get a round of applause for everyone opening themselves up? <laughs> what I love about this exercise is that it connects, I, so much, so many of the answers often come back to the work that we're doing, but it engages our emotional capacity for why we do the work. And I want you to think about that why as you're presenting yourself to the world publicly, because the why, your personal why, is often what is going to magnetize an audience more to you than the specific stats or the problems that you're trying to address. So thank you guys for engaging that. Our next exercise is another similar exercise. We're gonna to try to use three words to describe different things. I'm gonna give you a little bit more time because this is six different things. We're gonna do three words. Um, you don't have to finish all of them. Again, I just want you to you try to breeze through them, come to, stick on, settle on the words that come to you quickly. You don't have to like, it's not deliberative. Just whatever three words are evoked by each of these prompts, write them down. Can I read them? Yeah, oh, oh, uh, Hashem will read them out. So for those of you that don't have a copy, it says, in three words, describe your childhood. In three words, explain the beautiful future. In three words, tell us about your friends. In three words, what keeps you up at night? In three words, what is your purpose? And in three words, what do you value most? Okay, Ho hopefully you guys found some good answers. Um, so being mindful of time, I'm gonna ask for two people to share. Is there anyone that's willing to share some of your, or like one of your answers? Oh, yeah, great. Um, so which one? What, whatever you want, whatever speaks to you. Um, what keeps you up at night, space exploration, uh, universe, and my startup. Nice. Anyone else willing to share one of your answers? Yeah, great. It's 
explain a beautiful future, love, nature, and people. That's awesome. All right. Oh, one more. One last one. Great. Tell us about your friends, clowns, dancers, and adventurers. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so the reason, the reason we did this, it's a continuation of the last exercise of trying to engage the why, the emotional behind it, the human connection, the human things that drive you. And we're starting to also, as you're seeing, like describe the beautiful future, describe what keeps you up at night, your purpose. I want you to start thinking about, and you can, I, I encourage you to try to do this exercise again in a few weeks, because the, each time you do it, when you come to those three words, they can, they can become very, very sharp. And imagine it can be anything. It could be like, describe the beautiful future. It could be unicorn, moon, beaches, you know, whatever it is, like let the words just come to you. And I want you, this is a way for you to mine your inner being for your deeper purpose and for the things that then you can express in your video content. So I encourage you to, to come back to it. We're going to flip to the next page. So here, um, what I want you, to, we're, we're going to talk about the why. So hopefully you got some insights from those few exercises that we just did. So we're going to just in one minute describe why you're working on what you're working on. And here, please use language that you would use to tell your friend, your mom, your grandfather, your annoying uncle that's always going to make fun of you. Whatever you choose, choose one specific person that you talk to a lot and explain why you do what you do to that person in this page. So use everyday language. Also, I'm uh, passing a, a notebook around with, uh, for everyone's email and name. So hopefully as we do this, everyone can keep passing it forward. We can get everyone's email. We'll give you our... All of the secrets. Huh? <laughs> it's just for us to be able, if you don't have to put it down, it's just for us to share the way, like some of our tools. Um, it's just too complicated to try to like write it down. It's much easier to just email it out. Okay. Um, so hopefully you were able to find ways to take these human exercises and then personalize them in a way where you're describing your mission in everyday language. Um, this is something that I encourage you to take this part and share it with friends that are not in the impact space and see if they are able to read and discern what your work is um, in the follow-up. So again, for the sake of time, we're just going to go to the next exercise before sh instead of sharing. In this page, we're starting to get a little bit more practical. We're going to have a little bit more time. Um, I want you to define who your audience is. So this is thinking a little bit more abstractly. Who do you want to reach on digital platforms? Is this people that you want to do the impact work with? Is this people who, is this young people? Is this old people? Try to describe, use some adjectives. Age, um, gender is fine. I don't have to, but age is, is I think a better marker, but gender is fine also. Um, what are their interests? What is their, wh what is their geographical range? Um, just start, there's some prompts there, but just start thinking about who your audience is. We'll take a few minutes. I want you to start thinking about what, who, who you're talking to. And you can ha if you have questions about it, we'll, we'll come around and answer the questions. The reason I want you to describe your audience, and again, this is an iterative process, but it's a helpful starting point when you're thinking about what, you, who, what you're making and who you're trying to reach. Uh, if you Google literally just Google what are so-and-so watching, what are so-and-so watching. There's tons of white papers that describe what different audiences are engaging with. And it also is a really helpful way to start thinking ahead of time who you want to engage with so that when you start making content, you can evaluate, is it reaching the people that you want it to be reaching? You can, and then you can see, well, maybe it's reaching people that you didn't expect that you wanted to reach, and it's great. Or we need to adjust our strategy because we need to adjust, go for the people that we want to engage with and we're not quite reaching them. So if we can flip to the next page. Um, what I want you to do here is talk about thinking about what is the purpose, your purpose, in, uh, your human purpose, and the purpose of your organization or the organization that you want to work with. What can you do to connect people to that purpose? This is the tough part. This is creative work. So there's a bunch of prompts there that you can use to try to think about that. This is just the beginning. It's going to be an ongoing crea like creative pro journey for you to think about how you can connect your audience with the purpose that you want them to connect with or with the purpose of your organization. So 
Start, just start thinking about it. You're not going to get all the answers here right now, but this is just one. Hopefully, you can take this home and you can continue to engage in the process. Um, so, uh, you motivate us to, um, you know, to tell, uh, you know, to tell personal stories, our stories, right? But um, we have done it in our, you know, personal social media accounts. But when we are doing our office or you know our work social media account how do we <laughs> how do we plant our personal but you know we are not the only one we are not the only person in the organization and you know uh, there are other people you know which which personality do we choose what kind of you know how can we personalize the, you know um an organizational um it's a great account. question i think a really good way of thinking about it is starting from a perspective of consultation and what are the different people who you would want to engage and, or like, you know, who would be willing to be a part of it and then talk about like, what is our organization like? What is our mission? What is our personality? You know, what do we want our personality to be? And just experiment, like have everybody try doing some things and contributing. And it's okay if it feels weird or it's uncomfortable because when it's uncomfortable, that's when you learn the most. So just try a couple of things out, try different people posting. One thing that I've seen a lot of people do is office takeovers. So. You know, if you have five people in your office, Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, each person takes over for that day and they post whatever they want to post. And then you see what does well and, and what is what people are reacting to. Um, it's just engage in the process and you, you'll probably find that there, there's also if there's one person that's like, you know, the leader or the, the founder, then, you know, sometimes it's good to think about their personality because often the organization reflects their personality as well. So you want the social media to reflect that personality. Okay, um, we have just about five minutes left. And so we're gonna, uh, I, at this point, I think it's best to um, pause and then we'll take some more group questions and we'll leave the rest to be homework that you can do on your own. I'll just to give you a sense of what to, what to expect as you move forward with the worksheet. The next sheet is what are the raw materials that you can use for telling your stories. And when you do this worksheet, think about what are the images that you have access to? What are the stories that you have access to? What are the people or communities that you have access to? How is your impact work putting you in touch with as aspects of the world that people might not have been able to interact with? Because whatever you have access to that's unique. Someone said forests, who, that they're, you're at home in the forest. So if you, it, it, maybe it's images of the forest and showing people the way that you see the forest and the details that you see. Or if you work with specific types of people, what are the stories that you hear about them that you don't necessarily hear normal, normally? So that's what you should focus on for that one. And then, there, then the next sheet, uh, if you can flip it over, is also a way to think about different social media platforms and what each of their personalities are. So I, I encourage you to think about which one you want to choose and choose one and then use that one moving forward or like try to experiment with that one particular um, social media platform. And then at the very end, we have a sort of planning calendar. Um, the top, is, the green boxes are for you to think about generally where you want to be in, you know, in the near future, in the mid future, and in the far future, especially when it comes to talking to people online. And it's just a way for you to think about where you want to go because I think you want to calibrate the specific moments that you're working on against those sort of larger goals. And you want to ideally work in iterative process. So you, you know, you say, this is what we're going to do for the next month. You try that out and then you see how you are making progress against your larger goal. And then in the bottom, it's just different ways that you can like think about what are the ways that you can use, what are the people that you can use or the ways that you can engage in the process. Um, so these are just, hopefully it, it'll be helpful. And then from there you can have, um, specific voices or strategies, um, or ways of engaging with your audiences. So with the time that we have left, I think best is to take some questions. If you have questions about how this is supposed to be done or what, what is the intended uh, outcome of this, or if you have questions about anything in particular, we're happy to answer them. Also, if you're getting ready to leave, totally cool. You can, I know people have meetings, but please, if you are interested in the getting feedback on the analytics, we, we definitely want it. It's a really key part of the process and we will share that. Um, we'll email, email it out to everyone. So is there any questions? Yeah. Um, so how do you double check that there's no 
backlash from anything you post. I think uh, this is the biggest issue that things now are always taken in other ways. And uh, how do you counteract that and make sure that nothing uh, is misinterpreted? Yeah, I think that a couple of things to think about. One is, um, ironically, it's actually like there's so much on the internet that we see the things that get backlash, but there's so much that just doesn't get backlash, or there's so much that gets minor backlash. And that, so the fear is great. It's just like terrorism. Like the fear is greater than the actual outcome. Um, the, then the other thing to think about is if there is backlash and there is genuinely some, like an audience that is reacting negatively to it, hear them, make it clear that you are hearing them. And then if you have to apologize for misunderstanding or misinterpreting or whatever, and then be authentic about how you want to engage moving forward. Some of the most successful episodes that people have had on digital platforms are where they come back from backlash. Um, so it's really about listening and adjusting. How will one balance between the openness and confidentiality we have to maintain in terms of you know publishing a particular child story, uh, disclosing or not disclosing? You know, there's a dichotomy, right? How much to ex expose or what not to expose? So how one can take a call on that? It's a great question, especially when you're working with children. It's very, very tricky. Um, in the United States, there's a lot of different laws and guidelines about you know disclosure agreements you, you have, have to sign. Yeah, exactly. And child protection. And so I definitely you have to follow all the policies and, you know, and, and ask for permission when you're publishing people's stories. Um, I think that another way to think about it is if it's possible to find adults who are impacted by either the organization or by the issue that you're addressing, then you can have people address the audience and talk about the, their childhood journey and bring people into the mindset of childhood. I mean, you can. I, I think it's easier to find adults who you can who can tell the story of childhood. So, an adult relative or someone who, when they were children, went through whatever it is that you're addressing. Um, I think that it's easier to. Children is, is tricky. It's, a, it's definitely a tricky one, and I think the best way is to find an, an, a side way in through adults that can tell the story. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the workshop. Um, so I just I had a kind of context question. I, I was very struck by the part of your story where you talked about Mako being acquired by Disney and you going from being an insurgent to kind of being part of this the machinery. Man. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I was curious about how Soul Pancake is set up and now that it's owned by participant, kind of what the actual structure is there and what uh, effects that has on the kinds of stories that you tell yeah. or, or, and it's don't. Great, it's a great question. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, and how you tell them or don't tell them yeah, it's within a great that question. structure. I think the, the, the best way I can answer that is that we're just very, very lucky that Jeff Skoll is, is a, such a visionary for the way that he used the, his capital assets. Because participant, obviously we're trying to drive profits, but we're really invested in the way that we're able to organize our storytelling and investment in our infrastructure to tell those stories or to tell stories that are never going to ever return in a brand deal. It only could happen at participant um, because we're not beholden to shareholders on a quarter by quarter basis. Um, and that's really, it's, we're just really lucky. And that, unfortunately, that is not very common. Um, I was wondering, so I, I do a lot of land defense work, and I'm sure some, many of the people in this room do social justice work. And it seems like we get our largest engagements when there's police and there's violence. And that's the only time that we can really get any attention to our campaigns. Yeah. And all the, the, the before part of trying to engage them into the forests, engaging them into the lakes, into these beautiful places we're trying to protect, yeah. it seems very removed for a lot of people. And it's hard for them to connect to that when they're living in urban centers or whatever. Totally. And so I'm wondering, like, you know, some strategies or ideas or thoughts or tips on how to connect people to something that they're not feeling the direct harm of until they see people being hurt. Great like, question. That is like the hardest. Yeah, thing I, that's it's so tricky. I think that one one way to think about it is that um, controversy is definitely a way to spike viewership, but that an, an engaged viewership on an ongoing basis, even if it's very limited, is not is better than the spike. And so, even if what, whatever the strategies are for getting people engaged on an ongoing basis, it's much like it's okay that it's much much smaller, but grow it incrementally over time. And then ideally, when there is a big spike, try to use a tone that is much more of engagement and dialogue and mutualism than of outrage. Because I think that the outrage discourse is sort of worn out. People are looking for fresh answers at this point. So if you can talk about mutualism, community building, you know, all the protagonists of your story as opposed to um, the conflict, it will probably get you people 
to get people to engage with you on an ongoing basis. Um, I know we're out of time, um, but we, we will stick around outside. We'll talk to whoever wants to keep talking. Like, we, like I said, we're eminently findable. I don't know where the notebook is. If you need to leave, or, you know, please do give us your email if you want to get some analytics tips on an ongoing basis. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. We hope that you got something out of this. Yeah.